I want to share an experience that I had about eight years ago, and that was quite disruptive in many ways. It happened in the morning of January 5th, 2010, and as I opened my eyes, the room was still dark around me. I felt a bit disoriented. And when I finally managed to turn the light on, I realized that instead of my usual pajamas, I was wearing some kind of green and white shirt, you know, the type of shirt that covers you pretty well on the front side, but not, there's not much to cover you on the back side. I thought, that must be some kind of hospital. So what I did, I sat at the edge of the bed for a while, and I looked at the room around me. In fact, there was not much in the room. It was completely empty. And being an introvert, I needed some time to figure out what I was going to do next. So I waited there for maybe something like 20 minutes, listening to the sounds around me. I thought maybe someone would come. Maybe something would happen. But after 20 minutes, nothing happened. So I thought, I'm not going to spend my whole day here. And after a while, I decided I was going to, st to stand up, reach for the door, and then I went into the corridor. And when I arrived into that corridor, I saw a lady with a white coat, nice badge, pens and pencils. I thought, this lady must be a doctor. And sh she's going to help me. So I went to the lady, and I said, what happened? What am I doing here? She said, Mr. Mowgli, uh, you just had been through a burnout, and you are in a clinic uh, near Lake Geneva. So I thought, uh, what shall I do? Uh, what are the next steps? How long will I stay here? She said, Mr. Mowgli, please, uh, I guess you must be quite exhausted at the time, so I would advise, first thing you do, you go back to your room and try to get some sleep. That was frustrating. So I went back, I said, but what am I doing here? What shall I do? What are the next steps? Uh, for how long will I be here? <laughs> she looked me straight into the eyes. She said, Mr. Mowgli, I have just told you, please go back to your room and sleep, sleep, sleep. That's what I did. But after a while, after a few days, a few weeks in the, in the hospital, there was a turning point. I was having lunch with one of the long-term patients in the clinic. Well, you know, it was not really like having lunch in a restaurant. We were basically sitting at a table in the main hall where they would serve us the usual mix of food and medicines that you get in this type of clinic. And at that point, he told me, I said, Fred, you know, I've been observing you for the last two weeks, and I think you don't belong here. Uh, you had a lot of visit from your wife, your friends, even your kids. So what are you doing here, Fred? I think you have a life outside of the hospital. But if you want to get out of here, at the end of the day, Fred, it's your call. You need to make it happen. And I can tell you, this was like an electricity discharge in my spine. Because at that time, I realized that if I really want to get out of the hospital and reconnect with life, I had to welcome disruption. I had to fundamentally and quickly change my mindset so that I could welcome that disruption, embrace change, and move on. And thanks to my resilience, and also to all the support that I got at the time, uh, I could progressively recover and move on. Of course, it was not an instant recovery, and I'm very grateful to all the people who gave me support at the time, being the doctors, the caregivers, my wife, family, friends, my mentor, and I cannot find words to describe what a gift it was when two years later uh, I could go back to the hospital, but this time in a completely different setting. At the time, we had the luck to welcome our third kid, uh, the little Noemi, who then joined our growing family. And when I look back, I think that burnout has been really an incredible experience in terms of learning. So it was a great gift in a way. But at the same time, I'm aware that this is a big phenomenon in our society today, and it has a big social impact. So we should really do our best to try and prevent it. So in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to share with you some first-hand insights as to uh, what is the exhaustion process, what can you do to prevent it uh, for yourself, but also for the people around you uh, that you care for. But before we do that, uh, let's have a quick check with you in the room. I'm going to ask you, please, to raise your hand 
If at some stage in your life or your career, uh, some of your friends, a colleague, somebody close to you uh, went through the burnout experience and has been impacted by the burnout. So please raise your hand if that happened around you. Yeah, <laughs> look around you. <laughs> that's quite impressive, huh? So that's way too many burnouts. And let's see what we can do to prevent them. In the time that we have, I'm going to keep it simple. And I'm going to drive you through the exhaustion process uh, giving you some watch points around three main axes that get disrupted during the exhaustion. This is at the physical, at the mental, and at the emotional level. If you look first at the physical, what you need to do to manage your physical uh, part of the exhaustion, first you need to understand how your nervous system works. In your nervous system, there's a part called autonomous nervous system that constantly regulates your physiology. It can either stimulate your body, that's called sympathetic activity, or it can slow it down. And this is called parasympathetic recovery. And this normally is an autonomous regulation we're not even aware of. You can even monitor that uh, with some small devices. And I'm going to show you an example of how it looks like when this regulation works well. So here is what we did. We selected a person who had a good overall life balance, and we asked her to start wearing the device about 30 minutes before bedtime. And you see on this first graph the result of that monitoring of her nervous system during the night. So in the first 30 minutes, you see some red bars, and this corresponds to the sympathetic activity when the person was still awake and active. And when the person then goes to bed and falls asleep, you see that some green bars pick up, that's around 11 p.m., and that's when the nervous system directly switch into parasympathetic recovery, okay? That's what you would normally have uh, when the nervous system works well, and then it stays high for the whole night. So here the person had a full night of restorative sleep. That's a situation we would all like to have. However, if you overstimulate your nervous system uh, during the day, it will start to impact the quality of your recovery at night. And that's what you see on the next graph, where this measurement was done with a person just after a stressful day. And you see that during the night, something unexpected happens. There are some red bars that pick up in the middle of the night, which shows that the, the nervous system has switched back into the active mode, whereas it should be in recovery mode because the person is asleep. And that's the trick, is that here, the person is not awake. The person is asleep. So it can happen when we are asleep, and here, what happens is that the person, when she wakes up in the morning, she has basically lost one hour of restorative sleep without being aware of it. And it becomes even worse when your stress becomes chronic and you are more advanced into the exhaustion process. Then your nervous system is almost kind of locked into the active mode, which, of course, does not support you uh, to recover. And it's a bit counterintuitive, isn't it? Because, I mean, here we are chronically fatigued and tired, so our nervous system should support us and, and recover. But it doesn't happen, because it has been so much stimulated that it's kind of locked into the active mode. The next thing that gets disrupted during the exhaustion process is at a mental level. What happens at a mental level is that your ego does not want to accept that you are getting more and more tired. So your ego wants to maintain an ideal self-image. I call this the superhero syndrome. It means that despite the fact you're getting more and more tired and overwhelmed, your ego wants to project an image that you're still a kind of Superman or Wonder Woman, that you're on top of things, uh, but indeed, you're getting overwhelmed. This is a protection mechanism of the ego. The problem is, as the exhaustion progresses, you start to develop a biased perception of yourself. And towards the end of the exhaustion, there is so much tension in the self to ego axis that at some point, your ego will dissociate from the self. So you have a complete disruption of the self to ego axis. You get trapped into your ego, and that's the stage that is called depersonalization. <laughs> it's quite disturbing. At an emotional level, what happens is that you basically lose your ability to regulate your emotions, and you get stuck into the negative types of emotions. I'm sure you can think of someone around you who would qualify as an energy black hole or an emotional black hole, always stuck into the negative. See that you're <laughs> nodding. 
Yeah. Well, to be honest, that's more or less how you look like when you are exhausted and when you are close to burnout. And of course, that does not support you uh, moving forward. So you have a pretty good understanding of how the exhaustion works and how the different axes get disrupted um, by now. And I'm going to share some tips as to how you can manage that proactively. It's a simple yet effective technique to uh, manage that. I call that the uh, green ball analogy. So the green ball, it stands for your self-care and recovery. The green ball is your time for doing nothing. It's your time to slow down, rest, and recover. Right? And what happens as modern jugglers, like this guy in the middle of the chart, at some points we are so busy juggling with all the activities in our life that can be work-related, personal project, family, friends, we keep ourselves busy. And we tend to neglect the green ball. We tend to neglect our recovery. So it's very simple to remind that. Uh, if you want to be a happy juggler and keep juggling, yes, you juggle with all the rest, but make sure you always keep an eye on your green ball. Because if you don't, then what will happen is at some stage, you may drop your green ball, and that's when you burn out, right? So what do you do when you're in burnout? In burnout, you need to understand something. Burnout is like being a hostage. You're a hostage to your nervous system that is locked into the active mode. You are a hostage to your ego. And you are a hostage to your negative emotional state. You know, you're locked emotionally. So you're in that hostage situation. And the question is, how do you get out of that? You know, how do you stop being a hostage? I got the response to that question from Professor Joel Cole-Reiser, who is trained as psychologist and hostage negotiator. And during his career with the FBI, George has been involved in many hostage negotiations. He has been involved, even himself, taken hostage three or four times during the negotiations. And here is what George told me. George has told me at some stage, he said, yeah, Fred, you know your, your burnout story. I think you're right, it's like a hostage situation. I think you're right, Fred. In burnout, it's like hostage. But think about it. Who is holding you hostage? Who is the hostage taker? Yourself. <laughs> it's yourself. Right? It's yourself. So how do you get out of that? And that's the thing. It's a paradox because you're both the hostage and the hostage taker. And it explains also why you cannot get out of burnout in your, on your own. You're going to need support from people around you who can be a secure base for you, who can help you rebond, create safe bonds. You know the attachment theory. Uh, you need to create safe and secure bonds uh, among other human beings. That's what we are here for. We are here for to care for each other. So you need that security that will not, you cannot create within yourself because you're in that hostage situation. So you need that security from the secure bond and the, the secure base around you. Let me tell you what my friend Patrick did uh, to be a secure base for me. That was in the evening, just before the blackout that I described before. I was freshly admitted into the clinic, very unstable state, and my friend Patrick, when he heard that, he just dropped everything at work <laughs> and drove to the clinic. Uh, there was my wife and his wife at the time, and after some point, he stayed with me, and I was in a very unstable state. I was paranoiac, psychotic, and he stayed with me for the whole evening. I've been asking him a lot of twisted questions, all the questions that I had in my mind at the time. And he stayed with me. He kept the bond. He kept being a secure base. And around midnight, someone came and asked him, he said, Sir, are you part of the hospital? Or are you just visiting your friend? And said, no, sorry, I'm, I'm just visiting my friend. And he said, so, sorry, sir, but you will have to go. And then Patrick realized I was going to lose my secure base. So what did he do to keep the bond and to keep the secure base? He took his jacket off, gave it to me, and he said, take this, Fred. With this, you will be fine. And I can tell you that without that jacket, I would probably not be here today. Because in the next week, after that event, that jacket 
was like a safe harbor. It was my secure base, right? So I want to ask you as a conclusion, uh, you know, we all have ups and downs in life. If you're in a point in, uh, in your life where you're up, maybe it's time to look around you and look at your friend, look at your colleagues, and think about it. Maybe you can be a secure base for your friends and colleagues, and maybe it's the right time to lend your jacket to someone. And if you are in a low point in your life, please don't keep it for yourself. Look around you, look for your secure base, and reach out to them, because sometimes all we need in life is a good friend and his jacket. Thank you very much. <laughs>